um, uh, Professor Richard Wilkinson is going to talk about uh, how to uh, how more equal societies re reduce stress and improve well-being, a topic which now more than ever is at the utmost of importance. Um, and the format for today's webinar will be a, a 45 minute presentation from Richard, followed by a short break, um, a short comfort break for everyone. Uh, and then we'll go into your questions and answers. Um, so can I just say good, good morning to you, Richard? Good morning. Hello. Nice to be with you. Good morning. Um, where, whereabouts are you, uh, are you today? Just outside York on a nice sunny day. Lovely. <laughs> York's a beautiful part of the country, so that's, that's nice to hear. Well, um, if you go north it is, or west to the moors or the dales, but just around York it's pretty dull and flat. <laughs> well, uh, okay, well, last time I visited I thought it was quite nice, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, Richard, uh, Richard's books and papers have drawn attention to the tendency for societies with bigger income differences between rich and poor to have higher prevalence of a wide range of health and social problems. And among other books, he was co-author of The Spirit Level with Kate Pickett, a bestseller now available in 24 languages, and he's co-founder of the Equality Trust. Uh, in the last few years, Richard has given hundreds of conference addresses and media interviews around the world, um, including at the WHO, the uh, European Union, the OECD, and the World Bank, and the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland is delighted to join that esteemed company today. So without further ado, I'll, I'll throw over to you, Richard, and you can begin your presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Um, well, it's nice to be here. Um, it would be even nicer if we could do it outside. <laughs> but um, I, I want to talk to you about um, inequality as a, a source of chronic stress, to say a little bit about what chronic stress does, uh, and about what the connection is between stress and inequality. I, I think that Although people know that stress matters uh, to health um, and all sorts of other aspects of functioning, I think people don't really understand the main sources of chronic stress in a, in a population. And so that's really what I want to go through. Um, my first, the first point I want to make is most people have a very naive view of, of what inequality is, is really about and why it matters, if, if they think it matters at all. And of course, many people don't think it matters. Um, but I guess if you asked most wealthy people, they might say it only matters if it creates um, terrible poverty. But actually, it's more about those feelings of superiority and inferiority. It's the psychological effects it has. Um, the idea that some people are worth so much more than others. Um, and uh, that's, it changes the quality of social relations. In a way, I want people to see inequality as, um, as a form of social relationship, uh, a hierarchical relationship between superior and inferior. It's that psychosocial side that I want uh, people really to, to see. Um, I'm going to take you, I, I'm going to end up with stuff from our more recent book, The Inner Level, um, but I need to precede it, I think, by some of the uh, material from our earlier book, The, the um, Spirit Level. So basically in the spirit level, we showed this relationship again and again with different problems up the side on that vertical axis, uh, whether it was violence or imprisonment or worse health or physical or mental health or more obesity, uh, all getting worse with more income inequality. And I'm just going to uh, say a little bit about that. Uh, what we did basically was to take um, the scale of income differences in uh, um, different societies using a measure that you can just download. We got it from the UN Human Development Report. Uh, it's how much richer is the top 20% than the bottom 
and you see in those more equal societies on the left, uh, the top 20% are three and a half or four times as rich as the, um, the bottom 20%. But in the more unequal countries like the UK, Portugal, USA, Singapore, the gap is twice as big. Um, and that's, that's what allows us to look and, and see what difference it makes. Um, one of the things that we did um, was simply to download um, life expectancy from WHO for each. Of, we, we were looking just at rich developed countries um, and children's maths and literacy scores that you can get from OECD. They test children in schools in all these countries. Infant mortality rates, homicide rates as a measure of violence, um, imprisonment. Uh, that's the proportion of the population in prison in each country, teenage birth rates, how much people feel they can trust others, obesity rates, mental illness, um, which in the standard psychiatric classification of mental illnesses includes drug and alcohol addiction, and then some data on social mobility. Um, and here, what you're seeing is that uh, the more unequal countries on the right, um, using that data from the last rainbow slide, um, uh, the more unequal countries on the right, and they have worse outcomes for all these kinds of uh, things. They're all put, all these are put together in one index. And you see the more equal um, uh, Scandinavian countries and Japan on the left doing much better. Um, it's really a very striking uh, relationship. Um, we also, uh, as a sort of separate test bed, looked at the 50 states of the United States, asking just the same question. Do the more unequal countries, as uh, more unequal states, do worse on these measures? And the picture is very, very similar. Um, almost everything that's related to inequality internationally is also related uh, amongst the American states. So, um, you know, this is a very, um, um, it, it's, it, it's very clear and well-evidenced relationship. We were, when we were doing our book, by the way, those, that rainbow slide I showed you earlier of income differences, countries of course have changed their income distribution uh, quite a bit since then. So, that was what it was like in the early 2000s. Um, uh, but I'm showing you that because those are the slides from our spirit level book. This is um, uh, the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing, um, which I like to show because people might think we'd chosen problems just to suit our argument. And here you see. Um, basically just the same relationship, except um, doing worse is now um, at the bottom rather than the top. Uh, so basically whether you have worse at the top or bottom is different between those two slides. So here there's more unequal countries on the right are doing worse in terms of child well-being, just as they were doing worse in that index of health and social problems. Um, it's a very striking relationship. We've also looked at changes in the UNICEF index of child well-being and changes in inequality. Uh, and of course, there's a statistically significant relationship. So a country like Sweden uh, that um, uh, used to do very well and has had quite big rises in inequality. Um, its uh, position in terms of uh, child well-being has slipped uh, as its inequality has risen. Um, this is and now a lot, a great deal of work on relationships with inequality. Um, this is experiments where they look to see how many wallets are returned, um, lost wallets um, in different countries. And uh, you see a, a huge uh, and striking tendency for uh, to be much more likely that you get a lost wallet returned in more equal countries. 80% of them come back in those more equal countries at the top, whereas only about 15 or 20% come back in more unequal countries. Imprisonment um, now, 
this is log scale up the side so it compresses the the top if you like um, but the differences between uh, Japan at the bottom and the USA, you've got at least a tenfold difference in the proportion of the population locked up. That's not, uh, that's partly more crime, but most of it is more punitive sentencing. In more unequal countries, you get sent to prison more easily for longer. Um, the prison regime is also uh, harsher and um, we found that the age of criminal responsibility for children is younger in more unequal countries. Uh, and amongst the American states, the more unequal states are more likely to retain the death penalty than the, the more equal ones. Um, I don't know whether it's a, a matter of the, how much trust there is, um, how much fear there is up and down the social hierarchy, or uh, whether the less empathy for uh, I don't know what's what's driving that relationship, but I think you need to be thinking in, in those sorts of terms uh, about this relationship between uh, inequality and the proportion of the population in prison. This is, we, we um, originally looked at bullying in schools um, compared to inequality, but this is uh, Frank Elgar's work. Uh, he's got more countries and a uh, uh, another measure of inequality. Um, uh, this is the proportion of 11 year olds who bullied others two or more times um, in recent months. And uh, again, the differences are absolutely vast. Um, you've got about uh, what down on the bottom left, about two, three percent of kids bullying others in the more equal countries, and it goes up to at least 20 percent in the more unequal countries. Um, so we're not talking about small differences in perform performance that go with inequality, we're talking about huge differences. Um, uh, this, I, I'm, I'm not gonna go on showing you these <laughs> slides with different social problems up the side, uh, but this is an important one because um, uh, people think, sometimes think, that inequality is fair if people can find their right level in society. The idea that if you're brilliant and work hard, you move up, and if you aren't, you move down. Um, but actually, what this shows is there is less social mobility in more unequal countries. Um, I think that's really, um, this is intergenerational mobility. Uh, I think it's really that uh, parents always pass on their advantages or disadvantages to their children. And if the, the difference in, in those advantages and disadvantages are bigger, uh, then um, uh, the differences in um, how children do. I, basically, it's asking, do rich children have rich parents or um, and, and do poor poor parents have poor children, um, or doesn't parental income matter very much? And what it shows is that parental income is very important in more unequal societies. Um, and if you're interested, for instance, in, in um, equal opportunities for children, probably the most important thing you can do is to reduce the inequalities in the society more generally, um, the inequalities um, amongst parents. Um, this one actually uh, showing it rather the same reasons. I think people um, think that inequality might also be justifiable in terms of um, you know, the idea that it encourages initiative, creativity, individual, and, and get people more likely to um, have a bit of that sort of cut, cut and thrust. Boris Johnson obviously thinks he's going to get from Brexit. Um, but what this graph shows is actually, if you look at a measure of uh, creativity and in innovation, like patents per head of population, it's actually lower in more unequal countries. Um, and actually, when you see there are more people with mental illness, there's less social mobility, um, kids do less well in those maths and literacy scores, there's more drug abuse, you can start to understand 
why um, there's less creativity uh, in more unequal countries. I want now to show you what I think is the sort of core of the effects of uh, inequality. Um, and it is, as I mentioned at, right at the beginning, about the effect of inequality on social relations. So here we have um, a, a measure of uh, people's participation in community life, now, whether they belong to voluntary groups and uh, local organizations, um, uh, that kind of thing. And you see it's lower in more uh, unequal countries. Um, community life atrophies with greater inequality. And it's been shown lots of times. Um, people's willingness to trust each other is also diminished. So this is the proportion of the population who agree that most people can be trusted. And you see on the right, it falls to what, 15 or 20 percent of the population, whereas in those more egalitarian Scandinavian countries, it rises to 60 or 65 percent, feel they can trust others. If you're walking at home alone in a big city, it makes a diff big difference. Um, you know, in big British cities or USA, you have to be aware of who is on the street um, uh, at night around you. You know, you're sort of looking over your shoulder a bit. Um, whereas in countries like Sweden, you just relax. It's, you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. Um, it really does make a, a a very perceptible difference. Um, I, I, I should say there are also papers that show that people are less willing to help each other in more unequal countries, less willing to help the, the disabled or the elderly, things like that. Um, basically, people become more out for themselves with greater inequality. This is um, uh, homicide rates, the red dots are American states and the blue ones are Canadian provinces. Huge differences in homicide um, related to inequality. So you can see the bottom left, you've got about 15 homicides per million, rising to 150 or so. Um, <clears throat> and that, that relationship, actually the relationships between inequality and both violence and health were sh first shown in the 1970s. There are now literally hundreds of papers looking at these uh, different um, health and social effects of, of inequality. Um, I, I'm not, I, I, because other people have controlled for all sorts of other things, you know, like education and poverty and so on. Uh, and I know these relationships stand up to that. I'm just showing you the, them in the simplest form um, so people don't have to understand more sophisticated statistics. Um, if you go to much more unequal countries, for instance, like Mexico, where the inequalities are much bigger than the United States, um, you see that people, it's gone a stage further. People are afraid of each other here. They put bars on their windows and um, on their doors and they have razor wire around their fences and um, they, um, uh, uh, the same thing in South Africa. Um, those lines you can see, horizontal lines near the top are an electric fence. And that notice that you can not quite read says armed response. If you're caught um, climbing in, you might get shot. And you can just see in the bottom right two enormous dogs that uh, pretty well eat you up if you got in. So, you know, you move from more equal societies with a great deal of reciprocity, with community life, a strong sense of trust and so on, to these societies where people are frightened of each other. That is really an appalling um, thing, particularly as we know that it, and the people who study the determinants of happiness or health, how important the quality of social relations is, uh, crucially important. Um, 
you know, the studies that show over a follow-up period, whether you have lots of friends and so on, well integrated socially, is at least as important as whether or not you smoke to survival over a follow-up period. Um, so uh, it, inequality gets to the very heart of a society. Uh, it damages it right at that, 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 those most important ways. And that picture I've just given you of the effects of inequality um, is shown uh, in a quite different way. So this, um, again, with inequality along the bottom, it's from two American economists, um, and they've shown it for a number of different countries here, as well as for the American states. With greater inequality, more of the labor force is employed in what they call guard labor. Uh, that means uh, security staff, police, prison officers, people like that, all the people we use to protect ourselves from each other. So it, it's really giving us a confirming, it's showing data that confirms on a quite different basis the picture I was giving you of the socially destructive effects of inequality. Um, I don't think we should think of this inequality, income inequality, as something quite different from what we've always known about class and status. Uh, the things that get worse with more inequality are the problems which have those social gradients, the problems which become more common lower down the social ladder. And you all know that health is worst in the poorest areas, that kids do worst at school in those areas, there tends to be more violence in the poorest areas. It is those problems which get worse with more inequality. The only surprise is that they don't just get worse amongst the um, poor. The biggest effects of inequality are amongst the poor, but even amongst the better off, there are small benefits in living in a more equal country. Uh, so I think we need to see it in terms of whether we live in a, a society with a very steep social hierarchy or, or, or a much um, shallower one. And it makes a difference to the quality of relations. So it's not separate from what we've all known about uh, class and status and the social ladder. It's telling us more about that relationship. It's telling us that we can make the differences between uh, classes or uh, uh, we can make them bigger. Um, we can uh, make status more important um, uh, with greater inequality. Uh, everyone talks as if they think class is a bad thing and snobbishness is a bad thing, but you know, they need to know that we can reduce its importance by reducing the material differences between us. Um, oh, I, I should have got a um, uh, something I wanted to read you. I haven't, but um, there is a very important paper comparing uh, poverty in uh, rich and poor countries. Um, and uh, they interview people in poverty in India and um, uh, East Africa and Pakistan, but also in, in countries like Britain and, and Norway. Um, and the picture on the left is, is poverty in Norway. Um, the picture on the right is poverty in India. Um, but they interview people about their experience of poverty. And the, despite the totally different material meanings of poverty in those two worlds, their experience of it is astonishingly similar. They talk about feeling degraded, devalued, ashamed of themselves, uh, feeling looked down on, all those kinds of feelings. Uh, and they try and hide their poverty. Um, by dressing as, as well as they can and, and so on. Uh, so I want you to think of this as about our sensitivity to being looked down on, disrespected, um, uh, devalued. Um, it's a sensitivity to where we are in the social hierarchy. And if everyone gets a, a, a bit richer, uh, 
it doesn't really change that to, uh, that sensitivity to social status. If we make the differences between us bigger, it makes everyone more aware of those differences. It makes us think those differences are more important. And one of the ways in which you see this, um, uh, that people start, and basically think of, I, I, I'll go back to that slide while I talk for a moment. Um, you see that if you're living in a very unequal country, some people are regarded as hugely important and others are regarded as almost worthless. Um, and so we all worry about more about how we are seen and judged. You know, we take uh, almost a, the, a person's personal worth, you know, whether they're any good, their abilities and so on, almost as if social status was a marker for that or a measure of it. Uh, uh, and so, you know, there are those downward prejudices and uh, people who have them very strongly think of the poor as poor because they're lazy and stupid, those sort of attitudes. Um, <clears throat> and you can see in more unequal countries, people are more worried about status. So this um, study um, from Leighton Whelan, it's uh, status anxiety, a measure of status anxiety and up the side. It's about whether people say they feel looked down on because of their income or jobs. Um, and along the bottom, you've got the tenths of the income distribution. So you've got the poorest tenth on the right and the richest tenth on the, uh, sorry, the poorest tenth on the left, the richest tenth on the right. And the top line are the higher levels of status anxiety in all income groups in more unequal countries. The bottom line are the lower levels of status anxiety in all income groups um, in more equal countries. Um, and so you can see how the material, bigger material differences between us jack up the importance of status. They raise the stakes. Um, it matters more to us. We worry more about how we're seen and judged. Um, and indeed, uh, we are, as human beings, uh, psychologists have shown we're particularly sensitive to those sorts of uh, uh, anxieties. So this is from a meta-analysis of, I think, 208 studies, looking at what people find stressful and they're given different tasks to do while having cortisol levels measured that you can measure in saliva or in blood. And uh, uh, the, the, they find that the, the tasks that most reliably push up levels of uh, uh, cortisol are tasks that include social evaluative threat. Uh, that means, uh, worries about how you're seen and judged, uh, threats to self-esteem or social status um, in which others can uh, might negatively judge your performance. Uh, so we apparently even people who thought they weren't particularly bothered by that sort of thing under these experimental conditions you see it's affecting the um, cortisol levels just as much. So those issues to do with how we're seen and judged are particularly important stressors. Um, and there are also a range of experiments called stereotype threat experiments in which um, uh, they study the awareness of status differences on social performance. This is a, a study that was carried out by people at the World Bank uh, with Indian children from different castes and they were given little pen and paper tests to do and uh, uh, when they didn't know who was high and who was low caste uh, the kids did equally well. As soon as they did know who was high and who was low caste a huge gap opens up and those effects have been shown for um, class and status in, in rich countries as well, also for gender differences. Um, 
uh, so anything that makes us feel we belong to a group regarded as inferior or less good at a particular task affects performance um, now i'm i want to take this into uh the issues of of, of stress um the mental health foundation a couple of years ago showed how extraordinarily stressed uh, uh, this is the uk population um, three quarters of the population felt so stressed they were overwhelmed or unable to cope sometime in the past year um, and half of that uh, proportion uh, had actually had suicidal feelings as a result of stress. Um, uh, you see in each case a higher proportion of younger adults um, and many had had, uh, had, had self-harmed. Um, and you know, for the societies like us living in unparalleled comfort and luxury, that we're feeling these kinds of worries is, is simply, uh, well, you might think it's bizarre, um, but we have to understand this. We have to look at those issues to do with social relations that I was talking about. Um, we know very well how stress causes uh, worse health. This is a, uh, the general health questionnaire um, a measure of, of psychological uh, stress and uh, you can see um, the connection here between higher levels of stress and higher death rates um, so you go from uh, in the reference group which you, know, you call their death rates uh, one and then uh, the most stressed um, have death rates over twice as high. But what is perhaps interesting here is that the death rates start to rise even at the very low initial rises in, in stress. So it's not just that the columns are bigger on the right, they start to being, being bigger as uh, measures of stress show the uh, very early um, in rises. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the differences in life accept, uh, expectancy and healthy life expectancy are absolutely obscene. These are figures for Scotland. Uh, between the, the most, the 10 percent of um, most privileged and most deprived areas in Scotland, 10 year differences in life expectancy for women, 13 years for men. This is the biggest human rights abuse in, in developed countries. Um, and in healthy life expectancy, the gap is, is almost twice as big. And it's really appalling that we live in societies that tolerate this. I was really shocked that people were so surprised that the COVID-19 death rates were so much higher in deprived areas and amongst uh, um, uh, ethnic minorities um, because you know it, it, it's very much like most other causes of death. Um, <clears throat> now as I said with people worrying more about how they're seen and judged and status uh, and class being more important in those uh, societies with bigger differences in income and wealth, we become more worried about other people's judgments. Um, this is uh, Martha Beck, uh, um, who apparently is Opera Winfrey's style coach. I guess most of us don't have style coaches, um, but she's talking here about uh, um, Meet, uh, worries about meeting other people. She says the real enemies are shame and fear and cruel judgment. She says she's one of millions of party impaired people, social phobes who dread party talk, um, who are petrified of saying something stupid, something that they will reveal us as the jackasses we are, rather than the social maestros we wish we were. She felt she needed a whole armory full of impressive weapons to survive a party. Things like cleverness, thin thighs, social connections and wealth. Every act from choosing clothes to making small talk 
is a fear-based defense against criticism. And yet she's obviously somebody who manages these things somehow. Um, and if you think of uh, people who suffer really badly from social anxiety, they avoid social contact. Uh, they shut themselves away. They find uh, the, that social contact is too stressful. Uh, so they don't go to out in the evening or to parties or whatever. Um, even going shopping is often uh, um, a very demanding activity. I've um, heard of people who uh, shop during the day uh, because they can wear sunglasses um, and uh, hide away a bit more like that. Um, and you know, they do self-checkouts and so on um, for, for these social reasons. We have found uh, that there are two responses uh, to these uh, worries about social contact. One is uh, that if you're worried about how you're seen and judged, you, you go, down, go under in a sense. You feel you're not clever enough, you're not good looking enough, you're not funny enough. Um, and of course, these worries are particularly um, uh, severe amongst teenagers and young adults, um, perhaps particularly amongst young women who, you know, we all know the figures of how uh, the proportion of young people, particularly girls, who hate what they look like. Um, uh, so you either feel you're no good um, or you do the opposite. You know, if you're worried about how you're seen and judged, you go in for a sort of self-advertising, self-enhancement. You, you try and show people in conversation that you're a rather good, successful character. And we actually find measures that show these uh, characteristics are uh, stronger in more unequal countries. Both those responses are, are more uh, common. Um, I'm just going to take you now into a, a little bit of the, the sort of evolutionary background to why we have these extraordinary sensitivities. Um, in public health and epidemiology, uh, it, it, social status, bigger social status differences that I've been talking about, or low social status, are extraordinarily damaging to health. Friendship, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is quite the opposite. Uh, friendship is... is uh, um, uh, is highly protective of health. Um, and in a way, those are the two opposite ways of coming together. You know, members of the same species always have the potential, because they have the same needs, to fight for everything. If we need the same food, the same shelter, and sexual partners, and so on, uh, we can fight over everything. So, uh, Social dominance is simply about all these things being sorted out according to who is strongest. Uh, and if you think of uh, dominance hierarchies in among, in, in amongst monkeys or other animals. Friendship is about a recognition of each other's needs. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the gift is the symbol that uh, I do recognize your need. I'm not going to fight you. We can cooperate. We can share. Uh, so those are the two opposite ways in which people can deal with this business of um, uh, needing the same things, having the same needs. Um, and words like companion um, in different languages uh, are made up of those two words, con meaning with and pan meaning bread. So your companions are the people with whom you share the necessities of life. Um, you know, these things are very deep-seated, um, and we eat together as part of that. It has the same root, the same symbol. Um, uh, uh, we're sharing the necessities of, of life. Each time we sit around a table with other people and eat, we're doing it together because these are the necessities of life. Um, and uh, um, have I got to... Yeah, uh, a remarkable um, American anthropologist um, 
who studied um, hunting and gathering societies most of his career, made this lovely statement, gifts make friends and friends make gifts. You know, the gift is the symbol of sharing, um, of recognition of each other's needs. And it, it has such a powerful meaning because of that. Um, uh, and most of our prehistory in those hunting and gathering societies, uh, our societies were extraordinarily egalitarian. Um, inequality starts to rise um, in a, from early agricultural societies onwards. Uh, so most of our existence as anatomically modern human beings with brains the current size, we've lived in uh, egalitarian societies. Now, where have I got to in terms of time? Um, a bit longer. Um, the We've been helped understanding how these issues relate to mental illness by this paper by Sherry Johnson and colleagues uh, at, who are at um, uh, Berkeley in California. She went through an enormous literature on uh, mental illness and um, uh, personality disorders and found how they were related to issues to do with dominance and subordination, uh, either um, sparked off by those issues or exacerbated by those issues. So for instance, uh, you might feel everyone is trying to put me down. My whole life is about trying to maintain some respect and self-esteem uh, um, when I, and it, it's often a, a, a major source of violence, you know, incidents of violence are triggered often by people feeling uh, humiliated, disrespected, put down, um, things like that. But you may feel alternatively or that your life is about a, a struggle for um, uh, uh, to gain respect and status. Um, you might feel, you know, you're one of the people who feels they're not good enough and you avoid social contact. Um, uh, you find um, social meetings just too stressful. Um, and, you know, that's related to depression and so on. Um, on the other hand, you might be quite narcissistic. Um, and uh, respond the other other way, um, self enhancement and so on. Uh, so we began to look at uh, papers that show differences in these uh, responses between more and less equal countries. Um, we knew anyway that mental illness um, was more common in more unequal uh, countries. Um, those are WHO measures. Um, they, they, they're not simply about people being diagnosed with depression. They're about um, people uh, and use, uh, it's, it's, the data is based on um, uh, standardized, um, um, what are they called, the measures of um, diagnostic interviews. Uh, on random samples of the population. So you're not asked, have you been diagnosed with depression? You're asked about your patterns of sleeping, your, uh, 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 um, your appetite, your uh, friendships, your feelings of self-worth and so on. Um, a, a more recent study in the British Medical Journal has shown a similar pattern that um, uh, with the exception of alcohol and su uh, alcoholism and suicide, which are slightly more common in more, not really significant differences in more equal countries, all those other things are much more common in uh, uh, more unequal countries. Uh, so eating disorders, anxiety problems, schizophrenia, depression, ADHD, um, all more common with more inequality. Uh, here's a graph of um, depression uh, in, in different American states and a significant tendency for depression to be more common where there's more inequality. This is a measure of self-enhancement um, 
in relation to inequality. Self-enhancement, you could call it self-aggrandizement or self-advertisement. People are asked in these different countries, how do you think you compare with the average in your country? And it's a bit like, you've probably heard the joke that I think it's 96% of Americans think that they are better drivers than the average in the States. Um, but, you know, you might think you're uh, more generous than other people or more, um, uh, more intelligent or whatever it is. So they measure people's views about themselves in relation to what they think is the average for their country on a number of different outcomes. And this shows that, you know, in more uh, unequal societies, people uh, are going in for this kind of self-enhancement, um, uh, which is closely related, obviously, to narcissism. And uh, you see narcissism does rise with income inequality. Uh, Jean Twenge, who is... Uh, uh, um, the sorry, as it were, the doyen of looking at population psychological changes over time, uh, showed that narcissism has risen quite dramatically, um, and we noted that that was while inequality was rising. Schizophrenia, other people have shown schizophrenia is more common in more unequal societies. Um, Drug use, um, you can imagine if you have these high levels of social anxiety, worries about how you appear to others. Um, maybe you have a few drinks before you go out um, in the evening, or maybe you, you're more likely to take ecstasy because, you know, ecstasy apparently makes you feel just so relaxed and at one with everyone. So it gets over these kinds of anxieties. Um, the, uh, 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 another way, most obviously, that we go in for self-enhancement is by consumerism, you know, by having expensive clothes and things, by um, status consumption. Um, and there are studies that show there's more of that in more unequal countries. Um, uh, buying clothes with the right fashion labels on or um, uh, flashy cars or whatever, if you live in a more unequal area. Uh, incidentally, of course, this sort of consumerism, um, uh, it's really powerful and uh, it's a big obstacle toward, uh, for the way of moving towards sustainability. Um, and the advertisers know this only too well. Um, and you can see how important these trends are uh, in that as debt, uh, sorry, as inequality rises, that blue line, this is American data, debt also went up. So people are borrowing to um, increase their expenditure to keep up with uh, richer people above and so on. And it's an appalling situation. Other studies show there's more bankruptcy with more inequality and, and people getting into debt. So pretty worrying picture. Um, I was going to show you, but I think I've taken rather long time, um, a little bit about uh, what's been happening to inequality and what we can do about it, but perhaps we should have a break before that. Um, so shall I stop now? And if people want, I can take you through half a dozen more slides on uh, what's been happening to inequality. And um, what so, so yes, Richard, so that, that would be great. But I, I think, so there's a number of um, questions related to that, those particular issues, what we can do about it. So maybe in the process of answering those questions, you could take us through the slides um, once we move on to the Q&A, if that, that's all right. Um, I think at this point, uh, and, and just to say thank you for what was um, enthralling and, and really powerful presentation, and um, some of the some of the comments in the chat have been um, reiterating how much um, people have, have have taken from the presentation. Uh, as you say, I think at this point it might be worth taking a break, letting that settle in, um, and we'll return in in five minutes to take your your questions. Um, so, if, so if participants do have any burning questions that you would 
like to add, or if you've not had a chance to look at the Q&A to see what's in there, um, please do that. Uh, please do that just now. Um, uh, and if you have any comments to share with participants, please do so in the, in the chat box. And we'll be back at uh, about 11 o'clock. Um, just okay. questions and answers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Good. Bye.
Okay then, everyone. So we're uh, we're at eleven o'clock just now, and I want to um, I want to just give um, as much time as we can to questions. There's I've I've got a note of around ten or so questions here. Um, please keep adding Q, uh, them to the Q and A because we'll we'll try and get to as many as we as we possibly can. I guess I guess Richard the um, um, can you hear me, Richard? Yes. Yes, I can. Good. Um, I guess the initial um, uh, and probably most burning question people will have is around uh, the pandemic um, and uh, the impact of the pandemic on inequality. So one of the questions in the Q and A box was: Will will the pandemic result in widening inequalities? In Scotland, and just wondered if I could get get your views on get your views on that. Um, I haven't studied um, that, but my impression is that people think it will. Uh, there's, all, I, I believe, there's already evidence that it's increasing inequalities, and uh, not only in incomes. Um, and uh, there are, of course, a lot of people whose um, incomes are unaffected. They can work perfectly well at home, but. Um, uh, people um, whose work can't be done at home, which includes, I suppose, uh, a great many unskilled and manual workers, um, that's not an option. I saw a tweet from a carpenter who said he couldn't work from home because he didn't have a five mile long screwdriver. <laughs> um, and the same is true, I think, for, for children as well. The, um, children of um, uh, from poorer backgrounds uh, are getting very little from school. Um, children who go to private school seem often to be getting quite good lessons online. Um, so uh, differences not only in incomes but in children's performance education might be uh, almost certainly widen widening. And uh, so, so there were a couple of questions about specific characteristics and the connection that they have to inequalities um, and income inequality. Um, so Ashley had asked a question in the Q&A about the connections between race and income inequalities. Um, and Derek uh, from Deaf Scotland had messaged me um, privately to, to ask around uh, uh, income inequality and disability specifically. D does our increasing distrust and fear around each other as income inequality increases and also in increase, does that also increase racist beliefs, uh, behaviours, structural race inequality and, and, and what about the impact of living with a disability in a more unequal society? Well I think that uh... And sometimes all these other inequalities are referred to as horizontal inequalities, um, you know, gender and ethnicity and um, um, disability and, and so on. I think that um, in, they aren't quite different uh, processes, that when anything becomes uh, a marker of low social status, um, you know, if skin colour or um, any of the markers of class um, or, um, and it might not be skin colour, it might be religious affiliation as in Northern Ireland, or it might be uh, which linguistic group you belong to in some societies. Anything that becomes seen as if you like, a marker of inferiority, um, but that covers anything to do with looking poorer. Um, because we do have this rather strong tendency to judge each other um, uh, by the material differences. And I, I think even the sort of racism of the colonial period, you know, coming from um, European countries um, to going to countries with um, less sophisticated technology, 
immediately the colonial populations, uh, the colonial um, and the, the British or the French or whatever, regarded those other societies as having a less advanced technology because these people were less intelligent or something like that. They were less able. So, you know, it's an extraordinary um, widespread tendency and we do it all the time within our own societies. Someone has a low status job, you think of them as stupider. Um, and although I, I don't believe the genetic stuff at all, I think that uh, it's been shown that the extraordinarily powerful uh, environmental differences, I don't mean there are no genetic differences, but basically the uh, uh, hundreds, uh, maybe thousands of genes that have some aspect on um, how we function mentally. So whether you're uh, good at spatial stuff or have a good musical sense or good mathematical sense, you know, there are lots of different dimensions of these things that make us good or bad at different things rather than a gene for intelligence that people have been arguing about. Um, but we do know that <clears throat> as time passes, populations, uh, at least as measured by intelligence tests, show that whole populations are apparently getting cleverer, if you believe those tests. And um, uh, we also know that the longer a child is in poverty, uh, the, uh, that it really does affect brain development. So we know about lots of environmental things that uh, unfortunately do affect ability. Um, but the most important thing is, is education. Um, and somebody could have the, all the genetic advantages for being a good mathematician, but unless he or she does a good mathematics course, is well-educated mathematically, they won't be a good mathematician. You know, our hunting and gathering ancestors with the same genes as us were not good mathematicians. <laughs> so learning the stuff or you can have all the genes for being musical, but unless you learn an instrument and so on, you don't get very far. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, just before the break there, you, you um, so, mentioned... So I, I didn't actually, I, I went off on a bit of a Sorry, side. I'll go, Richard, sorry. Basically, um, any of those things that become markers of low social status attract the same sort of stigma as... Uh, is caused by inequality. Um, so I don't think it's quite different. And indeed, the uh, women's disadvantage, for instance, uh, pay disadvantage increases if there are bigger income differences in the whole population. Um, ethnic differences, uh, you know, uh, there's more prejudice and so on, um, and bigger income differences between ethnic groups. So. And I think so. Just you've 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 just added a comment around um, uh, the um, men and women, um, and we were asked in the chat whether there are uh, any particular studies in relation to the differences between men and women's health and um, income inequality in different in different societies. So it's it's, it's helpful to have, um, to have covered that. I, I think just before the break. Um, one of the comments uh, um, that was made by Lorraine, and this ties into the, the additional bit of your presentation, Richard. One of, one of the comments from Lorraine in the chat was that um, as individuals, we, we probably feel like there's very little that we can do about macro income inequality across different nations. So uh, on that basis, what are the key policy actions? What are the key things that we should be as individuals or campaigners or groups uh, calling on various governments to deliver to help create a more equal society in Scotland, the UK, in our local areas, in our community councils? What, what are those kind of things? Well, is that a, an invitation for me to talk a little bit about this? Please take it as an invitation for that. That would be great. Um, I, I think that inequality is driven by politics. Um, Paul Krugman in the United States has shown quite a bit of evidence that it is. In Britain, 
Um, let me just get this slide um, up, uh, the next one. Yeah, can you see that? Um, it's a slide of trends in income inequality, is that? Yes, you can you? see that, yes. Um, and you see that, that those are two different measures of in income inequality, and you see they both rise dramatically um, in the Thatcher period. Um, when neoliberal economics, free market fundamentalism comes in with Reagan and Thatcher. Um, and since then, there have been little ups and downs, but we're all the time on a much higher level than we were before. Uh, before um, that rise in inequality in the 1960s and 70s, our inequality was similar to um, what some of the Scandinavian countries are now. But um, what you see overall, um, these, these are lots of different countries, um, uh, and what's happened to their income inequality from 1930 to 2015. You see, basically, there's the same pattern in different countries of a long decline in inequality from sometime in the 1930s till the end of the 70s. And then from 1980, you get the modern rise of inequality. Uh, and that is about the, the strengthening of the labor movement, the free market, uh, sorry, the labor movement, um, social democratic parties, the idea that, the, that our societies, uh, that there's another way of doing things that's qualitatively better for, for us all. Um, it's probably also about the fear of communism. Um, but when uh, all that starts to decline, uh, unions are weakened um, and uh, um, the left, in a way, loses what, uh, any idea of what it's really there for. Um, and uh, um, it, you get this free market fundamentalism. Um, so in a way, that U-shaped distribution of inequality is about the, the waxing and waning of what I call the countervailing voice. Um, if you like, the, the strengthening and weakening of, of socialist beliefs. Um, that idea that there is another way our societies can work. Um, and that actually is demonstrated uh, extraordinarily by this graph. The top line is a different measure of inequality. It's the share of income going to the richest 10% in the US. You see, basically, it's that same U-shape. Um, the bottom blue line is the proportion of the population in trade unions. And one is a mirror image of the other. I don't think it's because unions make all the difference to wages. It's that the un union membership is a marker of the strength of that whole countervailing movement. Um, uh, and basically, you can see how tax rates have been lowered since, uh, um, well, they started to come down really in the late 70s. Um, huge income rises in income differences within big companies. Um, so, you know, CEOs used to get 30 or 40 times as much as the average production worker and and early this new century, they were getting three or 400 times as much. Um, but anyway, what we can do about it, um, basically we can reduce income differences either uh, through taxes and benefits, redistributing, or you can reduce income differences before tax and benefits. Um, and it looks to us as if it doesn't matter in terms of the benefits, which route you take. I think we have to do both. Um, I think we have to uh, not only have stronger trade unions, I don't think we'll be able to get them back to their former strength because uh, the, the huge companies that were unionized of the heavy industries and so on have gone. Um, uh, I think um, what we need to do is democratize the economy extend democracy into um, companies, uh, large companies, employee ownership, um, employee representation on company boards. Uh, Britain has no legislation for employee representation, but 
uh, countries like Germany have very strong, um, apparently a large company in Germany, half the people on the committee deciding pay have to be employee representatives. Um, about half the members of the European Union have some legislation for employee representatives. So I think we need to extend democracy into the economic sphere um, and not only by um, strong employee representation, but by more incentives to cooperatives and employee-owned companies. But in terms of taxes and benefits redistribution, we really have to stop all this tax evasion, which is so common amongst the, the super wealthy. Um, we have to end tax havens uh, and make, I and mean, at the moment, the tax burden is not progressive. Uh, the poor pay a higher proportion of their income in taxes. And occasionally the super rich point that out. Um, uh, I can't remember the man's name. Uh, um, there's a, a very wealthy American who um, has pointed out that he pays a smaller percentage of his income in tax than his uh, cleaner does. And really appalling situation. We funded the Equality Trust which uh, um, you can find it online, www.equalitytrust.co.uk. Uh, it's campaigns for greater equality. Uh, it'll, the, the number of um, uh, ways you can join in. It has local groups around the country. So you might find your city has a, a local group that you can join. Um, you can, there have also been um, uh, fairness commissions, uh, labor um, uh, councils of big cities have often set up fairness commissions to recommend how uh, you can reduce income differences locally. Um, and most of those um, councils have now pay the living wage as the minimum rather than the legal minimum wage. Um, and that makes some difference. Um, I think that there have been important movements in some universities uh, to ensure that um, people, cleaning staff and so on, are paid the living wage um, and sometimes uh, campaigns about the extent of, uh, of pay differences between um, uh, the vice chancellors and the cleaners and so on. So you can you can find out what your employer, what the differences are where you work. You can join local groups. That's I think about it. You can talk about it. <laughs> we, we certainly are. We certainly are doing a lot of uh, talking about it in in Scotland. Like one, one, of, one of the questions um, uh, talks about our, uh, the, the context within, within Scotland and um, what, what would you see as some of the key differences in terms of inequality in Scotland than the rest of the UK, if you've, if, if you've, if you've done any work around that. Um, we, we often, and as just referred to and, and Nick Ward had left a, a comment in the q and it says we often talk about being a more equal society here in Scotland is that true or is that is that a myth or is that um, is that something which we can achieve just now well your health inequalities are if anything bigger than ones in England um, I we were asked when when um, the first minister was Alex Salmon. Um, we were uh, sounded out to see if we'd do a, um, a paper on uh, inequality in Scotland and the benefits of narrowing income differences. Uh, we looked and found that the, it, it was hard to get decent measures of inequality uh, comparable. Um, and so we didn't we didn't do it. We thought there wasn't enough data to make any sound inferences. Uh, but I do think that those bigger health inequalities um, are very worrying. Um, 
uh, I suspect you have at least your share of all these social problems of imprisonment and drugs and um, uh, obesity and everything else that goes with inequality. Um, I think that, you see, inequality, it's a matter of where you are in the overall societal hierarchy. Um, some people have thought that it's a matter of how you compare with your neighbors. But of course, a small deprived area doesn't have bad health because of the inequality within it. It has bad health because it knows it's at the bottom of the uh, comparisons with the rest of society. People know they're living on a sink estate. Um, it's it's their position in relation to the rest of society that matters, not the differences with neighbours. Um, and uh, I think that in some ways, uh, because Scotland income dif income levels, average incomes are lower than in England, Scots probably suffer some of the effects of feeling that they're poor Brits. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if that is that effect is reduced by Scottish independence. Um, and, you know, you're part of the British hierarchy now. Um, if you were independent, maybe you'd be part of a different, a smaller hierarchy in Scotland. I don't know. Those are just some guesses. Yeah, I mean, that's... Quite a big debate, I guess not. Uh, I know that if I, was we're spot, resolve. I would be voting independence. As <laughs> just a, um, a kind of a follow up to something that you'd earlier that you'd earlier mentioned around living wage, um, and in Scotland there's been um, a big campaign for the living wage in social care in particular, which has been progressed by the Scottish government, not without difficulties in terms of pinning that down to what that actually meant because of the nature of social care. So you've, you've got people um, doing sleepover um, things and, and, and things like that. So I just wanted to mention that as a thing which has happened here, and that, that, that living, living wage employers seem to be growing all, all of the time. And that's the kind of thing which has been encouraged by, um, by our um, political system that we've got here, not, not just at Holyrood, but in, in councils and um, and I think procurement drives a lot of these kind of issues as well um, and and it's quite often not well considered in terms of how the state makes big change you know you can actually change things like economic inequality by having good policies around how you procure your services how you work with for example the third sector on on on, on good services it's, not, not really a question there, Richard, just, a, just an observation. You probably know that uh, there are uh, cities, um, I can't remember the key, where it started in Britain and it was borrowed from America, but getting at least public institutions to spend their money locally. Uh, so uh, it's an attempt to stop the money going out of the area, um, I suppose, into the pockets of these... Uh, multinationals that basically funny funnel money upwards uh, to the super rich uh, at the top um, I think that those are important and um, poorer areas should be doing more than that more of that uh, to avoid losing um, income and you've um, uh, you've written in the in the past around um, increase in economic democracy um, as a policy priority um, and obviously um, you've talked about company democracy there in terms of economic um, democracy uh, that's been a, an area of interest to our organization over a number of years so for instance um, we've been working closely with a number of partners on human rights budgeting as a concept as a kind of overarching concept what does economic democracy look like and what can countries do to achieve it? Well, I, the people who know uh, much more about this, I think uh, 
suggest that the route to having those um, constitutions um, of uh, for employee ownership, for instance, uh, the pathway, the legal pathway, needs to be made much more, much easier, so that you know when somebody who's started a company retires, um, it becomes one of the first ways they think of of what they should do with the, their company as they leave it. Um, there are ways of selling it to the employees where uh, lo the employees get loans to buy the company out and repay them from profits. Um, uh, I was once going to do some research comparing employee-owned companies with others. Um, I put together a research proposal um, but didn't, didn't get the money. Uh, um, they said it was too expensive. Um, but um, I, I think the idea of employee representation uh, has not only popularity on the left, but I think um, it's not unthinkable amongst some conservatives. So um, Theresa May, when she was during her leadership campaign, she said she was going to introduce it she got talked out of it by big business. Um, but uh, as I said, many European countries have got that kind of le legislation and I think we need to, to campaign for it. The, the trade union movement in Britain, the TUC produced a, um, uh, a pamphlet with a title like um, employee Workers on board, I think it is, um, talking about how it's not only important because actually those kinds of more democratic companies perform better, simply in economic terms, but they're also nicer places to work for. Um, uh, but they were saying that the business of companies being owned by share owners was becoming increasingly anachronistic. That, you know, if you go back to the 1960s, people owning a share in a, a company, they'd own a, a good block of shares, they'd know about that company, they'd keep those shares for some time um, and really have knowledge of that company. But now shares are traded all the time at high speed um, with computer algorithms um, and companies often don't know who their owners are. There are so many owners um, owning tiny little bits and they're changing hands so fast uh, that actually the share owners know nothing about the companies they own. Um, but at the same time, we've moved from companies with uh, huge numbers of manual workers and an a, a, a upper class administration to companies where uh, a high proportion of the uh, employees are highly trained specialists, scientists, engineers, whatever, who need that democracy to integrate their talents. That's what production now is about. The integration and, and the, the value of a company apparently is the skills of its employees, not, it, not its... Um, um, land or buildings or whatever. Um, so I think there are uh, lots of different reasons coinciding for company democracy. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, sense of control at work is part of, uh, it's an important influence on health at, um, uh, health at work. So lots of things pushing in the same direction. And uh... Lizzie in the chat has prompted me to um, to ask you about your view on universal basic income, which um, has uh, had I think growing um, prevalence in, in as a kind of idea in, in recent years as evidence of its piloting across um, different um, countries, I think particularly in Scandinavia um, and um, here in Scotland. There have been 
initial thoughts about um, trying to pilot something like that at a local authority level. Do you have a view on universal basic income as a concept in terms of how it relates to income inequality? Well, my partner and co-author Kate Pickett um, is uh, trying to set up a trial of it in Bradford. There's a big uh, birth cohort study called Born in Bradford and trying to make it part of that. Um, I, I don't know the details particularly of how you pay for it and how it relates to the benefit system. Um, but I think it will become an in, increasingly important idea uh, if our jobs are threatened, as people suggest they will be, by automation. You know, if automation and artificial intelligence is going to get rid of a large number of jobs, we need some other way of maintaining people's incomes. Um, uh, I, I think also the pace of technical change need, means we also need that uh, support which makes people more, perhaps more flexible. Um, but we also need to uh, not to suffer um, uh, in it, uh, not to suffer automation and so on in terms of uh, greater unemployment, but by increased leisure. You know, we should be planning futures where we all work less. Um, move to a four-day week or whatever. And uh, some societies are doing things like that, but we seem rather bad at it. Um, one, one of the questions as well in the, in the chat from, from Catherine was around differences in terms of urban and rural environments and what impact that has on um, uh, income inequality and then subsequently on um, the other the other uh, problems that you've you've highlighted. Um, would, you, would you have any kind of thoughts around that? Like how, you know, are countries with greater rural areas more likely to be unequal, uh, unequal or are, is that a contributing factor? I haven't seen um, studies looking at uh, the effect of that rural urban balance on inequality. Um, I suspect that inequality um, is uh, more difficult in urban areas. And the, there's quite a lot of work now on health um, uh, showing that people who live near green spaces um, have better health, you know, controlling as much as you can for individual differences. I suspect that Part of that might be that in urban spaces, you can't get away from the social comparisons and the ads all the time on billboards are reminding you of, you know, this makes you look more exclusive or whatever and status and uh, you're more concerned with all those issues and you're having them thrust on at you. I think what's relaxing about going for a walk in the country, you experience yourself in relation to the natural environment. Uh, you're sort of a bit further away from the social comparisons, which uh, what I was really talking about in relation to inequality. Um, uh, all my stuff on inequality is really about whether people feel valued or not, valued or devalued. Um, and that's, you know, friendship is important because friends make you feel valued. It, it's all part of the same picture. And uh, um, I think um, the countryside is protective. But of course, most of the countryside, and certainly in terms of England, is uh, people are richer. Uh, the rural areas are conservative. Um, and actually in Scotland, the really wealthy, uh, the huge landed um, families who've owned vast estates for generations. I and mean, that's one of the things you really have to deal with in terms of inequality. I mentioned before your talk that you've spoken to a lot of these issues at um, organizations like the OECD, the EU, the World Bank, the WHO. 
Um, what, what are the responses of decision makers to these, to the kind of compiling of these kind of macro inequalities? And do, do you get, I guess, I guess my question is, do you get in action? Are you getting warm words or, 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 or what? I think warm words is the, is the right answer. Um, <laughs> A few years ago, I think it was 2013, um, we got the impression that a number of world leaders had read our uh, Spirit Level book because they, were start, they started to make statements about the, the social damage of inequality when uh, there was very little else on that. Uh, that was when Obama said um, that inequality is the defining issue of our era and the Pope said something about um, uh, the source of ills, um, inequality being the source of uh, social ills. Um, and a number of world leaders made uh, um, statements of that kind but it wasn't followed by policy change. It happened, just happened even, even earlier, um, probably about the time the spirit level was published, which was 2009, I think. The, the inner level is much more recent. It's the sort of psychological side of this. Um, I was invited to give um, a evening lecture seminar to the Admiralty and senior civil servants from lots of government departments were, were there. And without my knowledge, there was an academic who was doing a placement uh, to study the civil service there. And he apparently uh, chatted to them afterwards. Uh, he wrote a, a paper in one of the academic journals about this saying, you know, immediately after that, they all said uh, how impressed they'd been and how they believed what I was showing them. Um, and then uh, the next day or a couple of days later, um, he talked, asked them, you know, what are they doing about it? And the answer was nothing. And through most of my career, I have felt that in terms of policy, people think it's almost rude to suggest things like this. So a lot of academics in health, uh, interested in health inequalities, instead of really talking about the big issues, they were saying that, you know, we should try and get a bit less salt in school dinners. Um, you know, as if that was going to make any measurable difference at all. Uh, and yet it's acceptable to talk about things like that. It was unacceptable. And nobody talked about inequalities when we were first doing this work. One, one, of, the, one of the questions just to put in there, one of the questions from Liz Rowlett during, during the presentation was around those kind of smaller ideas that sort of take up the space where the bigger ideas potentially probably need to be. So uh, Liz says solutions to income inequality in Scotland often include initiatives around better benefits advice or energy advice to reduce heating bills. Does that really cut the mustard? And I suppose that goes back to what you've just said about, um, you know, taking less salt in school dinners, you know, it's the, it's the equivalent of that. Uh, how do we get, how do we get beyond where we probably are just now, particularly in terms of the, the public narrative around some of these issues, I guess, and then the political action that comes from that public narrative. There was, I've just, I'm linking up a couple of questions there, but, um, but just interested in your views. Well, I think I, I showed you that U-shaped relationship between inequality during the 20th century. And, uh, I think, and part of the reason why I showed it is it, it, it implies that you need a, a, a very large, broadly based social movement, political movement, uh, to put pressure, sustained pressure, sustained over decades, uh, to make a difference. 
apparently when Roosevelt introduced the New Deal, uh, which was highly redistributive, um, he, he convinced the rich that we must do this by saying, um, we, we must reform in order to preserve. Uh, and I think that in the 1930s, uh, with the growing socialist movement and the threat of communism, um, they perhaps thought that the, the, the economic depression then um, was, would be seen as the collapse of capitalism that Marxism had always predicted. And so I think there was real fear. Um, and indeed, I think that um, the growth of um, those social democratic parties and trade unions and the fear of communism was good for capitalism. Now, I think it led to the growth, the establishment of the welfare state. Um, but I do think you've got to have these really strong movements putting pressure on, uh, you know, Boris Johnson has got to feel, he's got to be in an environment where he knows the only chance of being re-elected is if he does something about these problems. He's not in that environment at the moment. Um, so I think uh, we need uh, the, the political parties. Uh, um, and I, I, I am sorry that uh, Corbyn was seen as weak. I think if we'd had a, a leader with the same policies and a different sort of self-presentation, um, maybe we'd have been on the right track. Adrian has said in the chat, has reiterated your point around it being seen as impolite to be political about some of these issues. And I think that's something which a lot of our members will have experienced that when you raise, um, when you raise concerns about health and social care or, or inequality in any way that the, the, um, the system kind of suggests that you're impolite or, or, or whatever. Um, I've, I've, we, we're coming towards we're coming towards the the, the end now. And I just wanted to uh, finish just by asking you about about yourself, Richard, in terms of uh, what what are your plans for the future? And you, you mentioned that um, your part of Kate, Kate Pickett um, is working on a, a pilot in Bradford around UBI. Are you are you planning to continue to write about these issues? Where 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 does where does where does your career go next? Mm. Well, I'm 77, so I haven't got much career left. <laughs> um, uh, plenty I'm, of time, plenty of time. I'm, I'm really interested in how we manage the transition to sustainability, and I do think that's incredibly urgent. I think that greater e equality is um, a fundamental part of that. Um, I think that it's all extraordinarily urgent. So I'm trying to write more shorter, more popular pieces. I've done a couple of articles for The Guardian in the last few months. Um, but um, I work incredibly slowly, so um, I'll go on doing that kind of thing. I'm, I'm writing a paper for the, commissioned by the UN on a just transition. Um, to sustainability, um, by which they mean a, a more egalitarian transition. Um, so little bits and pieces like that. Um, I'm not sure. I, uh, Kate, though, um, she is she's involved in in some very major multi-million pound research projects like this born in Bradford cohort study of, I think it's 13,000 kids born in Bradford, um, but also uh, big studies of environmental issues and uh, food security and, and so on. Um, increasingly, she hands requests for talks over to me because uh, she's basically too busy um, so 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, so we've, we've run out of time and unfortunately we didn't get to every single question. Um, but I'd, I'd just like to close by really thanking you so much, Richard, for that very, um, very strong, powerful presentation and, and for taking the time to spend answering our questions. It's been hugely interesting and leaves us sort of with a lot of um, food for thought as we enter the, the new world post-COVID and the challenges that, that that presents us with. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm sorry my answers to questions are always so long. <laughs>